So good afternoon, um, everybody. Um, it's been a, a great day. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, a, an unusual opportunity to hear about all the work that's going on and what my um, colleagues are up to. It's ordinarily only something that happens when you go to international conferences outside of this country that you get an opportunity to hear about what's going on at the IO, PPN, etc. But uh, this has been wonderful. So um, I'm going to talk about um, autism spectrum disorder and attention deficit disorder. Uh, and um, really the starting point for this, for me at least, was back in the um, 1980s and 90s uh, when I developed, started my career doing research into autism. And um, at that time, uh, autism and ADHD, or hyperkinetic syndrome as it was referred to, uh, were considered to be completely different, separate entities, quite distinct one from another. We recognized that there were uh, children with autism who were often quite hyperactive, but we were dealing um, with a relatively uncommon childhood syndrome. So. The prevalence estimates for autism uh, at that time were around about two to four per 10,000 children, and the prevalence estimates for hyperkinetic syndrome were about 0.5% or so of children. So uh, we thought that they look, you know, were really quite different entities, um, and I think that perhaps some of that uh, view was also supported by the fact that if we tried to treat uh, hyperkinetic uh, symptoms in the autism spectrum disorder group with um, stimulants, often there was either little response or uh, there were a lot of um, side effects and exacerbations of the autistic uh, symptoms. So uh, it didn't really seem very likely that the two were like, uh, going to be um, related in any way. Around uh, about the sort of turn of the, to the millennium, um, reports started to emerge as the prevalence of both ADHD and autism spectrum disorder was recognized to be far commoner than uh, we originally thought. Uh, reports emerged of the co-occurrence of autism spectrum disorder and ADHD, and people increasingly, I think probably maybe especially within the more able, higher functioning group would see groups of children who seem to be presenting with a combination of autistic symptomatology and uh, hyperactivity, impulsivity, inattentiveness, looking quite a lot like potential co-occurrence of the two uh, conditions. And of course, that recognition eventually led to revisions to the diagnostic criteria uh, in, ICD, in um, DSM, from DSM-4 to DSM-5. Where in DSM-4, you weren't really able to make a, a diagnosis of uh, autism spectrum disorder and ADHD. If you made a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, that prevented you from making a diagnosis of ADHD. And that um, approach was changed with the publication of DSM-5. And as a consequence, uh, there was this realization that you could get the co-occurrence of these two conditions. As it happens, the sort of whole um, research communities were also rather divided uh, in that people focused very much on autism research or they focused very much on ADHD research. So when it was recognized that you often got the two occurring together, I started to go to ADHD conferences as well as um, autism spectrum disorders uh, conferences. And I was quite struck by um, differences in the research community and the delegates attending these conferences. I was used to going to meetings where there was low lighting, that people sat very still, uh, they were very attentive and quiet. And then I'd go to ADHD meetings and they were noisy, they were larking about, joking, they were interrupting, clamoring to have their questions asked. Uh, it was such a different experience. Um, and then uh, we go for the um, conference dinner, and then after the conference dinner, 
you know, most of the ASD community would have gone to bed and were fast asleep. The ADHD researchers were up partying hard. Um, so it was a great eye-opener as to how these different fields were attracting different people and different investigators. And that was perpetuating, I think, some of the divide uh, in our understanding of the, of the conditions. So um, with the realization that uh, there did seem to be this co-occurrence of autism spectrum disorder and ADHD, uh, I embarked on a, a study that we called the Biomarkers of Neurodevelopmental Disorders, or BioNED for short, um, funded uh, really partly um, helped by uh, encouragement from Eric Taylor uh, and funded by the um, BRC here uh, and my Senior Investigator Award and then more so afterwards by Action Medical Research and the Waterloo Foundation. And we were aiming really to recruit uh, individuals with, as it were, pure ADHD, pure autism spectrum disorder and the combined autism and ADHD group along with a typically developing uh, uh, contrast group. So we went to the SLAM clinics in order to ask for uh, cases to recruit into this project, um, and they would send us cases with ADHD, ASD, and ADHD, or ASD. And then we did our research diagnostic assessments. And one of the first striking things that emerged from that was that we had to reassign quite a significant proportion of the clinical diagnosis to research uh, groups according to our assessments. And principally, the reassignment was from the autism spectrum disorder group through to the comorbid ASD uh, and, and autism spectrum disorder category. Uh, I think that partly will have reflected the fact that the um, changes to the diagnostic schema uh, weren't really um, uh, uh, embraced by uh, the um, services at that stage. But I think it also points to the fact that um, uh, when you get comorbid presentations, uh, you need to recognize that the symptomatology of both ASD and ADHD might be modified and masked by the co-occurrence with the other condition. So you've got to have a different sort of clinical perspective and take on it in order to be able to make a, uh, a diagnosis. With all um, conditions where there is co-occurrence, uh, we need to try to understand what the nature or basis for that comorbidity might be. And there are various different sorts of potential explanations. Um, one explanation is we have to consider whether the comorbid group is really just a subgroup of one condition or the other, ASD or ADHD, as was uh, tended to be the case back in the um, 1990s, or whether or not it represents a completely different and distinct disorder, or whether there are shared uh, factors leading, uh, risk factors, genetic and environmental, that lead to autism spectrum disorder and ADHD, i.e. a genetic correlation or an environmental correlation, and whether or not there might be what's so called um, phenotypic causal association, uh, reciprocal or otherwise. So this design of the BioNED study was an attempt to start to begin to um, answer that question. Uh, and um, we decided that we would uh, select a set of neurocognitive correlates that were fairly well established as correlates of autism spectrum disorder and of ADHD, and then use that battery of tests to see what the profile looked like in the uh, four groups, the uh, comorbid group, the two pure groups, and our typical control group. And um, this is just some of the battery of measures that we used. Uh, we were using cognitive tests as well as uh, uh, tests of social cognition, uh, reaction time, inhibitory control. But we were also doing EEG investigations uh, using um, event-related potentials and uh, EEG metrics of connectivity to study uh, the neurophysiological correlates within the, of the conditions in the, in the groups. 
And I'm, because of time, just going to fo focus on reaction time, phase processing, and resting state EEG connectivity. Uh, the um, reaction time findings here, so reaction time variability has been established as quite a common uh, feature in individuals with ADHD. And what we see here are that the, um, the typically developing control group and the ADHD group show this difference in variability in reaction time. This is a different type of way of re measuring reaction time variation. Uh, and the uh, comorbid group show this similar difference, whereas the pure ASD group, uh, less of a, a difference. And you can incentivize people in reaction time tasks, but you still see after incentivizing them the same pattern of difference. So on this measure, the comorbid group were looking like an ADHD group. Uh, the um, uh, uh, electrophysiological responses to face stimuli leads to a um, negative deflection at 170 milli uh, milliseconds after the stimulus onset in the uh, temporal lobe regions of the brain, which is where the fusiform gyrus lies, which is the face-specific part of the uh, brain processing uh, facial information. And this in typically developing individuals, the, the ERP response is strongest in the right side uh, of the brain. Uh, and what we found is that when we compare the groups, uh, the N170 in the typically developing and the ADHD group shows this right lateralization, uh, whereas in the autism spectrum disorder group and the com comorbid group, uh, it's less lateralized, it's more bilaterally uh, represented, suggesting that the uh, ASD neurophysiological correlates in the comorbid group and the pure group are similar. Um, the connectivity analyses uh, capitalize on the fact that uh, neurons that fire together wire together. Uh, this is a picture of a brain and the, uh, the electrical uh, signals that are picked up on the EEG. We can look for correlations between uh, those signals across the um, brain surface or the scalp surface. Uh, and then uh, we look for analyzing the way in which these uh, signals are correlated and can use that information in order to be able to construct a network map and networks of the connectivity of the brain, this is functional connectivity, are described in terms of the nodes uh, of the network, the central hubs which might have lots of connections and the number of edges. And um, work by um, Elizabeth Shepard in our group analyzing the data uh, shows that um, the uh, uh, postulated hypoconnectivity that has been reported in autism spectrum disorder individuals uh, in our, our population uh, was present also in the comorbid ASD and ADHD group, but not evident in the ADHD and typically developing group, and that the uh, connectivity metrics were correlated with the severity of autistic symptomatology. So again showing that uh, there were features in the ASD group, the comorbid group, that uh, uh, resemble those in the pure group. By contrast, there was a hyperconnectivity pattern in different uh, frequencies uh, of the EEG G signal correlating with ADHD symptomatology uh, and that we could also identify in the, in the comorbid group. So just to summarize the findings, uh, what we're identifying is that there are some shared patterns uh, in co connectivity, ERP, face and emotion processing that you can see in the comorbid group that are uh, present in the ASD group, and then others which are uh, present in the comorbid group but are only evident in the ADHD group, response time, inhibition, reaction time, variability, uh, etc. So this is uh, uh, suggesting that um, ASD and ADHD reflects an admixture of these populations, at least in some cases. So the implications are that we need to be doing careful characterization of ASD and ADHD in our patients, and particularly our research populations, if we are to understand how uh, the features that we're investigating might relate to one or other condition, 
and that will involve joint analyses. Uh, we need to be using structural and functional metrics of uh, brain connectivity and looking at the um, biomarker response to treatment. Could these biomarkers be used to identify subsets of individuals, for example, within the comorbid population that uh, are more likely to respond to ADHD treatments? Uh, and I'll just end by thanking my uh, and acknowledging my colleagues here at the uh, uh, Kings, Philip Asherson, Jana Kunsi, and Gronja McLaughlin. Uh, particular thanks to Lizzie Shepherd and Charlotte Tai, who are the postdoctoral uh, fellows who've been uh, doing all the work on the on the study, uh, and my collaborators Mark Johnson and others at Birkbeck. Uh, thank you very much.